This is Wraith from Wraith Rain. I'm an author of serialized gay romance fiction. Every week on this podcast, I'll be reading a chapter from one of my gay fantasy shifter serials called Dragon's Rain. I'll explain at the break how you can find out more about the story and others I write. So let's get to it. Chapter 94 Living Myth Behemoth is the equivalent of the human's boogeyman, Anwar. Valerius responded crisply as he felt Caden's fear spike at the name and anger stirred within him. It does not exist, and I should not have to tell you that. Indeed, Anwar. Why would you suggest a monster from a fairy tale exists and is our enemy? We have enough enemies without adding mythical ones. Esme frowned at the silver dragon shifter. She clearly thought, as Valerius did, that this was in poor taste. Are you annoyed that you were last the party, Lilanwar? Wings too small and weak to make the flight without many rest stops? Now you must make yourself the center of attention with tall tales, eh? Valerian mocked as he swung another lamb chop around like it was a sword. He nearly spattered everyone with grease. Eat your food, Larian. Do not wave it about, Valerius snarled. Alarian stuck the whole lamb chop in his mouth and ripped the meat off down to the bone. Valerius could see the green dragon in Alarian's eyes. Raziel looked through his as well. The green and black dragons rumbled angrily at one another. Alarian grinned. There was lamb meat between his teeth, and Valerius ran his tongue over his own in annoyance. May added her own barb to Esme's. We really don't need you trying to make yourself more important than you are, Anwar. Trying to play hero for Caden is pointless. He is in love with Valerius, and that's that. I am in love with you, but that's not why Anwar is doing this, I don't think, Caden said over their bond. He is a show-off. I told you he would be annoyed that important things had happened before he got here. This must be part of that, Valerius answered. Maybe you're right, but Caden didn't sound convinced. Behemoth? What's a behemoth? Kayla asked as she offered Caden more fish. Caden, though, shook his head, clearly off his food due to simply hearing the name Behemoth. Valerius frowned. This was not good. Caden needed to eat. He had not before the interview due to nerves. Now he must be starving. You must eat something, Caden. Here, take this. Valerius urged a bacon-wrapped piece of filet mignon at him. Caden hesitated, but then the bacon undid his unease, and he ate it directly from Valerius's fingers. It would have been a delicious and intimate act if not done in front of everyone. At the moment, it was simply loving instead of arousing. Valerius picked up another piece of meat and offered it. Caden ate that too, but he also drew nearer to Valerius as if to shelter beneath his wings, which were far larger than Anwar's. Alarian had a point there. Behemoth is the name of a mythical dragon spirit, Kayla, Tez explained as he snacked on a chicken leg. It is said to rival even Raziel inside, but more than that, it has many heads. Like the Linarian Hydra? Caden asked, his brow furrowing. Fancy you knowing about the Hydra, dear, Esme said to Caden, and one hears that education is lacking these days. I've always loved myths about dragons, Caden admitted with a blush. Who knew it would come in handy? Caden, you are correct. The behemoth's heads are able to each command a different power. Lightning, fire, acid, poison, etc. All of our powers in one dragon, Tez explained as he licked his fingers with relish. He, clearly, was not put off his food. And as I said, it's huge and also mean. Fully evil. Worse than Alarian, even. Behemoth is a myth, so people give it every power. Claim it is bigger than any of us. Stronger, faster, more ruthless. Bah! Fairy tales. Alarian huffed and crossed his arms over his puffed-up chest. And simply because I take a firm hand in my territory. You all act better than me. You are not. We're not better than you because of how we handle our territories. We're just simply better, period, Tez said as he picked up another chicken wing from his plate. There was a moment when Valerius thought that Alarian might strike the plate out of Tez's hands, and yet another meal would be ruined before it had ended. The behemoth would eat you all for breakfast with your civilized ways. Alarian shook his head. Don't you remember your legends? The behemoth wishes only destruction. It would lay waste to your territories while you all bemoaned whether you should attack or not. What would the humans think? Oh no, some pathetic humans died in a fight. Bah, 
We should be grateful the behemoth is nonsense. He swept an arm across his body before he went back to the table where the food was and began to noisily eat the spiral sliced honey ham. Should Valerius bring out a trough for you, Alarian? Esme murmured. Alarian heard her, but just gave her a toothy grin. Now pork had joined lamb between his white teeth. Tahara spoke thoughtfully. Even if the behemoth existed, it hates this world and humanity, so there is no chance it would come here. The things our spirits thrive on are the antithesis of what it supposedly wants. Where did the idea of the behemoth come from if it's just a myth? Caden asked. A many-headed dragon that wants to destroy humanity? May lifted an eyebrow at Caden. Where do you think it came from? All the fears people have about shifters are encompassed in the behemoth. Which is another reason that it would seem unlikely that the faith would have anything to do with it, Jahara said. Mom? Caden called over to his mother. Ellen, Grant, and Tilly were just coming over with plates of food and drink. Valerius noticed that they had given themselves plenty of wine. Even Tilly had been given a small glass, though she was double-fisted drinking with a Coke in the other. After the interview they'd all had, he understood why. Yes, Caden? She asked after taking a large sip of red wine. Have you heard of the behemoth? Caden asked. That's a children's story? She said with an uncertain smile. Something that humans first and people who hate shifters made up. A monster, you know, the ultimate evil shifter who was here to destroy everyone. That's so not the faith, Tilly chirruped. You guys love the spirits who come here and join with people. You don't want anyone destroyed, Mom. Thank you, Tilly, but I'm not altogether sure if I represent the normal faith member any longer, Ellen said to her. I think your daughter is right, Ellen, Jahara pointed at Ellen. No one in the faith would wish to team up with such a creature, and these people who seek to bring more spirits into the world are believers above all else. There was a momentary silence before Jahara mended. Not that all believers. No, no, you're right, Ellen said and raised her wine glass as if in a toast. The people behind the bombings are zealots. They worship the spirits beyond reason. They, they are not well, I think. It is like their beliefs have poisoned the rest of them. Grant put a hand on his wife's shoulder. There are people like that in every religion, Ellen. There's nothing inherent about the faith that draws bad people. I would have to agree with you, Grant, but I don't know. The people behind the attempted bombing during the balloon ceremony? I thought I knew them. I thought I understood what they were capable of, and I didn't. I don't. Ellen drank more wine. Perhaps the faith wouldn't be interested in the behemoth, but humans first would, Esme said as she tapped her chin with the edge of her empty wine glass. As you said, Ellen, the behemoth is something that those who distrust and dislike shifters use as a reason for others to join their cause. Those fools would likely think that they could control something like the behemoth, May huffed with a wave of her hands. Good thing for them, it isn't real. But everyone but Anwar's certainty that the behemoth was a myth didn't seem to satisfy Caden. He still looked troubled. Jahara regarded Anwar with narrowed eyes, but then those eyes went to Caden. A flicker of worry crossed her face. She seemed to think Caden's alarm potentially meant that Anwar's suggestion had some merit. Valerius frowned. Caden was simply reacting to the menace of Behemoth's description and nothing more. Wasn't he? He looked inward. Eulair was awake and alert now, and it wasn't for the food. Raziel was looking down at its mate with narrowed eyes. Eulair made a soft hoot and tucked its head under Raziel's right wing. Raziel leaned down and gently nuzzled the back of Eulair's neck, undoubtedly trying to reassure the white dragon that there was nothing to fear from such talk. Anwar, you appear quite unmoved by everyone's comments, Esme remarked dryly. Oh, I have no reason to be defensive or resort to insults, Anwar said with a smile. I know I am right. He poured himself a glass of cold white wine that immediately frosted the outside of the wine glass. He took a sip, tilted his head to the side as he swished it around in his mouth, nodded and swallowed before taking another sip with satisfaction. He was like a cat with a bowl of cream. He was holding something back. Anwar, why do you think there's a many-headed dragon coming to destroy the world? Kayla asked as her brow remained furrowed. She had seemingly forgotten that Anwar had a tendency to exaggerate, as she was very literal herself. Kayla did not lie. Though what Anwar thought lying about the behemoth existing would do for him was beyond Valerius's understanding at that moment. He had merely managed to annoy everyone. Anwar took another sip of wine, allowing the tension to build, before he surveyed them all with a triumphant grin. 
because I have seen it. What? No. You're joking. Were you drunk? Only in your dreams. The commotion he caused by these words only seemed to please Anwar more. He was the center of attention and therefore in his element. Do you have some proof of this? Marban asked. He had settled in without Valerius knowing. Valerius turned to him and Marban gave him a nod. Valerius nodded back. Marban, Wally, and Rose were all standing together. Wally had made himself a sandwich from the roast beef and was sipping a mug full of frothy beer. Marban was drinking wine, absent ambrosia, and nibbling on tomatoes filled with goat cheese. Rose was beside him, holding her wine glass in both of her hands. Did you know that you can get some of my gay romance books for free? Every month, I have at least one book free to download, right from Amazon, so you can easily read it on any device. But these books can only be free for five days at a time. If you don't want to miss out, just sign up for my mailing list, and I'll send you an email whenever there's a free book available. The link to the sign-up form is in the description down below. I do have proof. Anwar took his phone out of his back pocket and held it up as if it were an exhibit. Valerius had the urge to snatch it from his hands and crush it. There was no uber dragon. He and Raziel reigned supreme. And yet, he was frozen as Anwar asked, Shoni, can I cast a video on a larger screen? Shoni nodded. She placed her plate and glass on the table before going out to a touchpad by a set of doors on the right wall. A screen descended from the ceiling by the head of the table. She then went over to Anwar to help him connect to the system. You have a video of the behemoth? Valerian asked as he chewed with his mouth open. Valerius shuddered. I do, and I will show you now, Anwar said as he tapped on his phone and the screen at the end of the table ignited. Valerius found that he was holding his breath as a grainy video began to play. It showed the desert at night, rolling sand dunes silvered by the fat white moon that hung huge and heavy in the sky. The footage was shaky, as it was obviously taken on a phone with someone running low to the ground. A woman's voice, low and whispery, started to speak. I followed her out here. I've known for months something was wrong. She was secretive, which wasn't like her at all. She could never keep a secret for the life of her. So it was obvious that she was holding back. Something big. But it was the other changes that worried me. That scared me. The unseen videographer was crawling up a sand dune now. Valerius could hear the soft shush of sand and the rush of her breathing as she scrambled up the soft side. Finally, she reached the top of the dune and looked over. She immediately slammed down to the ground. The phone showed them only darkness before she lifted it and dusted grainy sands from the lens. Finally, she slowly and carefully lifted the phone up so they could see whatever had caused her to hit the deck. There they are, she whispered as the video showed a rune that had no roof and was missing most of the walls. She's, she's in the center by the fire. As the unseen videographer stated, there was a huge bonfire in the center of the rooms. The golden orange light showed dozens of people dressed in white robes surrounding the fire. They were all facing the back wall, which was the one that was mostly intact. And on that wall was a sculpture of a massive dragon with many heads. Valerius felt a strange thrill at the nape of his neck. Caden's right hand curled around his, and the white dragon shifter squeezed it, as if giving him comfort. And it was comforting. He kissed Caden's temple. I've not begun this the right way at all, Shadi. I should have started at the beginning. I'll try now, just in case I... Just in case I get caught, the videographer said, and he heard the sand shift as she dug herself deeper into it, so that only the camera and her head were above the dune's peak. I had told you how strange Sakura was being, about how we found the dead cats, and then, and then little lion. There was a choke sound, but it was soft, as she clearly feared discovery. Sakura killed her, Chadi. I know that it's hard to believe my sister, the one who used to pick up spiders with her bare hands and take them outside the house instead of squishing them. But she did it. I know. The road figures began to sway, their hands lifted up slowly towards the stone hydra and then to the stars above. The camera followed them shakily, but going surprisingly steady when the night sky was revealed. The stars were like jewels against the black backdrop. There was no light pollution from cities to disturb that view. Valerius had a momentary pang from memories of ages past, where the sky had always looked like that. 
She mourned Leon's death with the rest of us, but she never cried. She would pretend to, but there were no tears, the videographer said. There was only disappointment, I think. Disappointment that Leon did not become a shifter. Valerius's brow filled with thunder. This was connected with the faith. As if the white robes didn't give it away, this statement did. Caden looked up at him meaningfully. He thought the same as Valerius. The faith. The behemoth. Then there were the other deaths. The beggars. The old people. Those who had no family to mourn them properly. She was always nearby when it happened. I swear she gave the beggars poisoned food and the elderly injections. The woman's voice rose and one of the figures down below looked up and she lay flat again and remained silent. There was only the hiss of wind over the sand. When no one came, she lifted the camera. It is insane that someone who loved life would become a killer, the woman said. So there had to be a reason for it, some good reason. And that's why I followed her to the meeting. It was a faith meeting, but hidden. Why would one hide a faith meeting? But all of them in the room listening to this knew why this meeting would be hidden. They spoke of a coming war, Shadi. One between shifters and humans. They said that there are too few shifters. They need to make more, the woman whispered. But that requires deaths. Many, many deaths. Valerius felt a cold finger wind down his spine. In his mind, he could see Raziel and Ayalair gazing at one another, but not with the normal love and devotion, but with worry. Why are they looking like that, Valerius? Caden had noticed it too. Valerius frowned deeply. Before Caden, Valerius would have thought that there was complete transparency between himself and Raziel. But then the mate thing had happened, and he had been thrown for a loop. What if there was more he did not know? What if there was more that Raziel simply wasn't telling him or hadn't mentioned? Wait, wait. The woman's voice in the video was frantic, and Valerius's attention snapped back to her. Something is happening. The sky. What is happening to the sky? Something wasn't right about that sky. There was a jagged line of red like a lightning bolt caught on film. Except this wasn't a still image. It was a live recording. The bolt pulsed and the red light streamed down towards the ruins. The camera jerked as she moved to get a better angle. For a moment, it showed the group of faith worshippers. What Valeria saw, but the videographer evidently didn't, was that there were two moving towards her position. She'd been seen. Valerius went rigid. The urge to cry out and warn her had his lips parting, but this was a video. It wasn't the present time. He was watching the past. The light. What was that light? No! No! The woman screamed and thrashed as she was caught hold of by two of the faith. The phone fell and the camera lens was facing towards the sky. The scream was suddenly muffled, and Valerius imagined that someone had stuffed a rag in her mouth to silence her. You shouldn't have followed me, sister. It must have been Sakra who spoke. There was another squealed response and crying, begging, but the words were indistinguishable under the gag. But it is no worry. It needs more lives, Sakura said in a tone that had the hair on the back of Valerius's neck rising once more. There were muffled cries and screams which faded off into the distance. The camera continued to record the night sky and the whisper of the wind over the tops of the dunes. But suddenly there was an eerie shout from many throats, and a red light flashed over the camera's lens before everything went dark and quiet once more. Anwar turned off the recording. Everyone stood there, uncertain of what they had seen or what to feel. Esme tapped her chin with her wine glass. Jahara stared off into the distance with a worried expression on her face. May bit her lower lip. Kayla, who rarely sat still for any length of time, was frozen in place. Taz gulped wine. Alarian chewed. I saw no hydra other than the stone one, Alarian said between bites. Not afraid of a sculpture, are you, Anwar? There's something more, yes, Marben asked. He looked grim. Rose glanced over at her grandfather, and whatever she saw there caused her to pale. Wally, too, looked uneasy when he saw Marban's expression. The two knew the king of the underworld better than he did. Anwar nodded. This phone belonged to a young woman named Tahira Antar. Her sister, whom she named, was Sakra Antar. Both of them were reported missing. Shadi was Tahira's boyfriend. He was the one who found the phone and the runes. Did they find Tahira? 
Tilly asked, her voice small. Ellen pulled her daughter close to her. Anwar shook his head. No, they did not find anyone. No bodies, no bones, no footprints leading into the desert. Nothing. But it is in what they did not find in addition to the people that is important. Look, Anwar fiddled with his phone and two side-by-side images came up. One was clearly the still of the back wall from the video, with the hydra clearly seen on the back wall. The second was a picture taken during daylight hours of the runes, but the back wall had no hydra on it. It was simply smooth stone. Caden leaned forward. Where did it go? Where did the hydra go? Anwar spread his arms. That is the question. I hope you're enjoying Dragon's Reign so far. Dragon's Reign is free for you to enjoy, but not free for us to make. There is a whole team working with me for audio editing, artwork, graphic design, and custom music. Most YouTube channels and podcasts have sponsors and take ads, but because of the kind of content we make, we can't run ads or get sponsors. Instead, we have other ways you can support me and the team behind this gay romance audiobook. One easy way is to buy or borrow my books from Amazon. They are all gay romance set in alternative worlds with vampires, or shifters, and other magical beings. You may not know that even if you borrow books with your Kindle Unlimited subscription at Amazon, they are free for you, but they still earn us money. The books are published under the name Ex Aratari, which actually means wraith in Romanian. And if you love audiobooks, you can get professionally narrated versions of every one of my books on audible.com. The link to my author page is in the description below, as well as to the first book of the series I think you'll really like. Thank you so much for your support. People like you enable me and the team to keep writing these stories of gay romance, magic, monsters, and true love and producing this very fun podcast for everyone. Thank you. Thank you.